Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, next episode of Governance Dialogues. My name is Elisa Cole and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center and it's my pleasure to host you back on this program. Uh, for those of you who have joined uh, in for previous episodes, you would know that we've been over the last few months demystifying the world of governance and rendering it perhaps more relevant and uh, understandable for an audience that is not necessarily all specialized audience of board members. And speaking of board members, a number of episodes that we've been hosting on this program have directly been in conversations with experienced board members from around the world, um, in conversations that seemed, that wanted to uh, get a better perspective uh, on the evolution that they've seen in their boardrooms, whether in conversations uh, with uh, David Beatty in Canada, Daniela weber in Germany, or more recently, Mich uh, Michel de Fabiani in, in France. And so a number of these conversations have already uh, focused on, on the world of boardrooms. At the same time, uh, a number of other conversations that I've had on, on this program have focused on, on the world of uh, corporations, and in particular, focusing on, on a debate that has been heating up over the last few months, and that is the debate on stakeholderism and the purpose of the corporation with the idea that boards shall... Um, shall essentially be cognizant of interests uh, uh, of not only the shareholders, but also of a wider group of stakeholders. And it, in, my idea for this particular episode was to bring those two worlds uh, together, to bring the world of boards um, together with the world of uh, stakeholderism and, and, and corporate purpose. And um, I couldn't think of a better person uh, to invite uh, than um, Alex Edmonds, who has, um, Edmonds, who has a, an immense experience on, on the subject. Um, and who's written widely, um, notably in his book, which is called uh, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. Um, and I think uh, it would be very interesting to get his views on, on this topic, on, on this intersection between uh, stakeholderism and board duties. Um, something that, as I discussed, uh, as I said earlier, we've already um, treated in conversations uh, with, for example, um, Colin Mayer, who is the former dean of the Oxford Business School on this program. So Alex, with that uh, introduction, I would like to welcome you uh, to the program. Thanks, Alyssa. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you join. And um, of course, I've heard a lot about your work. You're um, a star in the world of governance. Uh, and we've shared some uh, common platforms, I think TED Talk, the, the, uh, also the, um, the Yale University's uh, programs and, and a few other um, uh, places where I think our work has intersected. But I think for those of you who are, have not, uh, are not active in the world of corporate governance, let me just say a few words um, around, about your work. Uh, which has indeed been very impressive. You're a professor of finance at the London Business School currently, um, also managing director of the Review of Finance, associate editor of the Journal uh, for Financial Economics. And your work uh, has been, has been um, echoed in a number of uh, financial um, uh, press, of course, the Wall Street Journal, the FT, and, and many others. So I think um, what I would like to do today with you, if, if we have the time to, to do so, would be to delve in some of the findings of your book, which has received um, a, such, a, such a warm applause from the, from the community, um, and, and talk about how companies are, are managing to combine, what you, as, as you say in your main thesis, purpose and, and profit. So with that in mind, um, could I go to you and just sort of um, ask you that specific question of, of, of in your book and in your research, what, what kinds of companies have you actually come across that successfully combine these uh, two mandates? And could you give us some examples of, of those? Absolutely, listen, I'll try and introduce some examples which people might not often think about as marrying these two. So I'm going to start with an example of, of Vodafone. So why do I think Vodafone was able to do this? What are the examples of purposeful actions? In 2007, Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. And that's something which um, in the first seven years dragged a 200,000 households out of poverty because it gave them access to mobile money when previously they had to rely on cash, which is problematic. It can be stolen, it can be forged and so on. Also, this contributed to gender parity because it allowed women to move from agriculture to business and retail. 
So why do I think that was a great example? So we often think about purpose and responsibility as splitting the pie more fairly. So this might be donating a lot of profits to charities or paying higher wages than we need to. And obviously, fair distribution is, is really important. But my, why my work is about growing the pie is I think the most responsible thing a company can do is by being relentlessly committed to innovation and excellence, trying to come up with new things that serve wider society, such as the introduction of mobile money. And the interesting coda to this was that even though this was genuinely launched to solve a social problem, which is financial inclusion, ultimately shareholders became better off because they were able to monetize it. So it wasn't something which was just charity. In the end, it also made Vodafone more profitable and more sustainable in the long term. Interesting. Um, and let me, um, uh, on that point, um, ask another question that I would like to, to um, on, the, on the voter, for example. I mean, it's, it's in the world of uh, fintech, there has been actually quite a bit of evolution in, on, the, on this front, meaning that um, the world of fintech, I think, over this year has moved faster than perhaps other sectors. And indeed, I've had a conversation with um, uh, one of the advisors to the uh, UN Secretary General, uh, who's working on on um, on the uh, big tech and uh, the uh, looking at how to optimize the the contribution of big tech to solving some of the the world's most uh, intractable problems. Um, I wonder if you, in your experience, uh, is this ability to combine profit and and um, and uh, and purpose? limited or or somehow uh, more emphasized in specific sectors versus others? I don't think so. I think it's important. It depends on how you define purpose. So if indeed purpose is splitting the pie differently, sort of throwing money at a social problem, then that is something which can indeed be um, in in um, contrast to profit, even, even in the long term. Whereas if we think about purpose as actively creating value, that's something that one can do in, in every industry. Um, so you might, let, let me take sort of a more um, everyday industry. Uh, Coca-Cola is, is a drinks company. And one of the things that they're doing is they've got this initiative called Project Last Mile, which makes um, vaccines and medicines available everywhere in Africa, including the difficult last mile to a rural school hospital. Why do they choose to do this rather than donating loads of money to charity? Because this really uses their expertise. So their expertise is in logistics and transportation because they need to make sure Coke is available everywhere in Africa. And so they're using that logistics expertise to transport medicines. Now you might think, well, why medicines? Why not books? Because books is something which is really valuable. But with medicines, they need to be transported cold. And so this was a great opportunity, a great example of using what you're really good at to serve wider society, again, to grow the pie by using your capabilities to address social problems. And so that's something which didn't really cost them a lot because it was using yeah. the expertise that they already had. And that's why I don't think it's in intention with long term profit. Right. And it's, the Coke example is particularly interesting because, uh, you know, it's a large multinational company. I tend to work um, uh, more in uh, emerging markets where, um, as, you, as you point out, you know, a lot of the times the emphasis in the, on the sort of the companies or boards feel that they're where they're making contribution is on the philanthropic side. So when I work with companies, for example, in the Middle East, a, a number of them in their annual reports make some great disclosures about philanthropic activities, but really often confuse purpose with philanthropy uh, and it's it's an interesting distinction you're, you're you're making there so my question I guess would would be whether you think this um, distinction is well defined and well understood in markets beyond let's say Europe uh, US developed markets do, do you think that uh, companies operating in emerging markets are also making that distinction well and, and engaging in, in socially beneficial activities in, in the same measure as the let's say the large multinationals are? I'd say that the distinction is not even understood within the large multinationals, because <laughs> when there's an issue, right, what is the thing which gives you the most um, public relations, and the best boost your image is if I'm going to donate a lot of money to an issue. So when Mr. Floyd was killed, right, companies would immediately donate money to Black Lives Matter, when I think maybe the, the better initiative was to think about, well, what is the discrimination in all areas, not just race, but gender and so forth? And how is this discrimination involved in our recruiting process? processes and our evaluation promotion processes, these sort of more longer term actions, rather than the easy win of donations. Why? Because instead of donating money to a charity, a company could instead pay higher wages to its workers, 
or higher dividends to its investors, and they could choose what charities to support, right? A company does not have a comparative advantage in picking out the best charities, unlike the examples I gave of Vodafone launching in PESA or Coca-Cola using its expertise in logistics and transportation. So I think purpose is truly about using what you're good at to solve the problems in the world that you are uniquely um, positioned to solve mm. rather than jumping on whatever social issue um, that is. Then going back to emerging markets, so while I don't think is understood even in multinationals, perhaps the answer is even less um, understood within emerging markets like India, for example, has this law where every large company needs to give 2% of its profits to CSR initiatives. But these could be things which are not at all linked to its comparative advantage. And again, as I'm saying, many of the most purposeful actions that a company might undertake don't actually cost much in terms of financial expenditure. Instead, it's more a shift in thinking of the leadership of a company. How can we use the expertise that we already have to solve social problems? And that is more a mindset shift rather than a large financial expenditure. Yeah, that's interesting. And in fact, I've also worked in markets where you have this, um, this idea of, you know, uh, uh, again, going back to the Middle East, you have uh, religious concepts that mimic that concept of putting a certain percentage away uh, or donating certain percentage to uh, to social to social goals, um, and that that's definitely in, in place in, in other markets. And I also echo your comments on Black Lives Matter because all of a sudden, you know, uh, my inbox is starting to to get full with emails where where we're talking about looking for um, you know board members of color as if that wasn't really uh, uh, an issue you know uh, six months ago. So that that's that's really interesting. But I think one of the, the key um, issues that I find personally difficult to grapple with uh, is, is, is the issue of trade-offs. And I know you've discussed it in your conversation with, uh, with Lucian uh, Bebchuk when you had the debate with him a couple of months uh, ago. And that is, I think, the real crux of, of the problem is that the idea of purpose of the corporation, the idea of stakeholderism, I certainly believe in. But I think that where I personally start having problems with is, is, is how to hold directors accountable to this, these various groups of stakeholders? How do you uh, essentially make difficult trade-offs where ultimately you know, a decision it might be taken that doesn't benefit the interests of all stakeholders, but basically throw some under the bus and says these uh, stakeholders, for example, our employees are more important than our customers. Or I mean, I'm just giving a, a random example. Do you think that from your work that you've seen examples of companies that have taken these trade-offs seriously and that have um, come up with interesting strategies um, uh, from a board perspective of how to tackle these challenges. I do. And it's really good you asked this issue, Alice, because a lot of people think, oh, well, purpose always pays off in the long term. There's no trade-offs. And so we can sweep these things under the carpet. But there are definitely trade-offs. And these are the main things that hold a lot of companies back. I think in order to think about how do we assess trade-offs, we should think about what does the word purpose mean to begin with? Because often people think purpose means altruism, it's to serve everybody. But actually, if we think about the word purposeful, it means focused and targeted, right? A purposeful meeting has a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, I'm doing it deliberately. So a purposeful company defines right, what it is trying to achieve in the world and who it serves, but that has to be targeted. So it can't be. We're here to serve employees and customers and the environment and communities and shareholders. It might just be one or two. So let's take Engie, the French energy company. They were really committed to transitioning to a low carbon economy. Yes, they also care about shareholders and customers and employees, but the one thing which was really important was decarbonisation. They needed to make some difficult trade-offs. For example, when they shut down um, Hazelwood, which was the most polluting plant in the OECD, that made 750 employees redundant. So if their purpose was to serve both employees and the environment, that wouldn't help them make the trade-off. But because they said, no, the environment is first among equals, when the rubber hits the road, we're going to take the decision which is going to contribute towards decarbonisation, that helped them make the tough decision. Now, after making that tough decision, they didn't just say, oh, we're going to ignore the employees because they're not part of our core purpose. They then tried to work hard to find those employees with other jobs. They participated in this Latro Valley um, worker transfer scheme. But it was clear like, how to make the decision. It was decarbonisation. And then having made that decision, let's try to mitigate any of the negative consequences so that uh, people are not too adversely affected. Yeah. 
And I think that that's, I mean, the crux of the conversation, as you point out, is, is specifically in these types of, of trade-offs. And I think not a lot, not enough attention is being paid as to how boards are actually making these trade-offs and, and what kind of, um, you know, tools or what kind of real implications do these decisions uh, have? And NG is an interesting example. I was actually living in France uh, at the time that this was uh, unfolding. And um, there are many others. I'm thinking, you know, Norges uh, often is lauded in, in many domains, but, you know, and they also have taken decisions to divest from coal a couple of years ago. And one that I thought was frankly controversial from internal, um, from, from their internal point of view, but also, you know, in terms of their, ultimately in, in terms of the impact on the bottom line. So these are, um, I think it's, it's worth a longer conversation, perhaps when we, when we have uh, more time to talk about how boards are, 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 are dealing with these, with these trade-offs. But um, for the purpose of our conversation, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to ask you while we still have time is, is um, with respect to what, invest, what inv the investment community is doing in, in this space and how do they view boards who are, as you say, struggling and sometimes making these painful choices uh, is there a reward um, uh, for companies that have redefined their purpose? I mean, there are ultimately, I think, actually not that many in reality. Many say that they have, but I mean, there are examples of Danone and a few others keep circulating, it seems to me, unless you have a different view. So I guess my question is around what do you think investors are, are doing in this space? Are they rewarding behavior and how? Yeah, and this is, again, a really uh, important point. I'm glad you're touching on it, because the common view is often that investors are the enemy of purpose, that investors are just focused on short term profit. They want to redistribute the pie towards them. That sort of make great stories. And we like to portray investors as the enemy and say, well, let's put workers in control of a company instead. But how do I answer that question as an academic? I look at what does the evidence say? So let's look at perhaps the most maligned type of investors, which are activist hedge funds. Again, the popular belief come in and pillage a company and pay out dividends. But the evidence shows, and this is some really rigorous research by um, professors Alon Drav of Duke, Wei Jiang of Columbia and their co-authors, activist hedge funds come in, they create shareholder value, and that's not at the expense of, of stakeholder value. Companies become more productive, they become more innovative, they release more patents and so forth. So actually, shareholders want to hold companies to account for being effective and for being innovative because this is something which improves long-term profitability so what shareholders are trying to do is actually make companies accountable for taking it for taking stakeholder capital seriously also one of the most purposeless decisions a company can make is not necessary to pay the CEO too much or to engage in a share buyback, but not to innovate, for to rest on the status quo. One example is, is Kodak, right? So they fail to respond to the threat of digital cameras. Even now, once the company went bankrupt, Kodak is still not seen as an irresponsible company. They are seen as an innocent byproduct of this um, tech revolution. Yet I think they should be hauled for being irresponsible because they fail to innovate. Yes, it's true that the CEO and the investors didn't line their pockets, but the fact that they didn't benefit doesn't apologize for the fact that 150,000 people lost their jobs. So I think the role of investors is to wake up the next complacent company and make sure that they're staying on the ball because if not, then both shareholders and society will be losing. Yes. So on the, on the point of uh, con executive comp, uh, I certainly agree with you. I think that in my view, of course, we've had a lot of um, discussion uh, especially uh, around the financial services sector of, of excessive ex executive compensation uh, following the previous financial crisis. But I think still sometimes, um, especially in markets where I work, I think it's an issue that gets oversized uh, attention compared to some of the more, as you point out, uh, egregious sort of uh, issues that are uh, swiped under the carpet under the, under the guise of you know, failure of strategy and whatnot. So it's, that is a really interesting point. But on, on, on the point of uh, markets and investors. Um, one of the things that I would like to ask you is, is whether you think that the dynamic of capital markets today, and you spoke about activist hedge funds and, 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 and others, um, but here I'm, I'm thinking also of high frequency trading, of, of uh, growing concentration of investors and, and um, other sort of features of capital markets that are emerging strongly today. Do you think that these uh, dynamics that we're seeing emerge are supportive of what we would call, quote unquote, purposeful uh, business. In other words, 
um, is it easier to grow a purposeful company um, away from the eye of public markets, at least in, let's say, initial phases of, of the growth of these companies? Sure. So you touched on two important, two interesting topics in your list. So first was um, short term trading and the second was concentrated investors. Let me look at those two things in turn. So let's first start with short term investors. Uh, and that's indeed a term which is commonly used, but I think it's somewhat misunderstood. So people look at investors being short term by saying they're trading frequently. Um, they've got short term holding periods. But actually, that confuses the holding period of an investor with her orientation. So what do I mean by the orientation is that when you consider whether to sell or not, are you basing this on short-term or long-term information? So it could be that you are selling a company in the short term, but based on long-term information, because you know that that company is focusing too much on short-term profit, it's not investing enough for the future. Let me give an example. So Ford hit record profits in 2015, and then its second highest profits in 2016. And yet a lot of investors sold because they were unhappy despite the high profits because uh, Ford was not investing enough in self-driving cars and electric cars. And that actually caused, um, led to uh, Mark Fields, the CEO, being made redundant. So again, I think complacency is one of the worst things that investors can do. If you think about the Vodafone shareholder, uh, sorry, so the Volkswagen shareholder base, that was really stable and loyal and long-term. They did nothing to stop the cheating admissions tests that, that were taking place. So if investors sell, but it's for the right reasons, not because they've missed short-term earnings, but because they maybe have hit short-term earnings, but at the expense of long-term value, that is something which can be supportive of long-term value. And again, what does the evidence say? The evidence is actually supportive of the idea of liquid trading if it's done for the right reasons. And that actually then links to your second question, Alyssa, which is concentration of investors because that determines whether the reasons are right or not. So I actually view concentration of investors as generally a positive. Why? If investors are fragmented, if they have small stakes in a company, then they don't have the incentive to get into the weeds of a company and do their own research. So they will evaluate a company based on things like short-term earnings because that's freely available. It takes a lot of effort and, uh, and um, time to try and do things like scrutinize intangible assets, employee culture, and so forth. And only these large investors, otherwise known as block holders, have the incentives to do that. So if you have large investors, then they're more likely to be basing their trading decisions on long-term rather than short-term information. And again, the evidence suggests that block holders generally are supportive of long-term firm value. Hmm. So while indeed one thinks, right, sort of private markets are better than public markets, um, we can sort of, what is the important feature of private markets? It's a large investor who really understands the company. And we can have something similar to that in public markets if indeed we have less fragmented ownership. That's interesting. I mean, there's a couple of um, reasons I asked that question. I mean, I, I, I do second your, your views about d nuances around short uh, short and long-term objectives. However, I mean, one of the things that I wonder about, um, you know, is is when I think of um, you know holding periods or or whatnot, is not necessarily the, the the selling and the buying decision, but market mechanisms such as high frequency trading, which, as you know, was was at length discussed in a, in a book which I found fascinating that was published a few years ago, Flash Flash Boys, I think it was called. Um, so these types of behaviors and how they actually drive market uh, and, and whether in, in, in that context you have uh, value being attached to corporate governance where you have uh, shares being sold and bought uh, uh, in, in, in such in, in such environment where basically the decisions are not being able not being made based on company performance today or tomorrow but just be basically on, on algorithms but that, that's perhaps a second a separate point of, of conversation well I, I think it's an important point can, can I just touch it because it's really interesting what, what you're talking about is that yes I, 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 I indeed know of books like that but I think we have to be careful about drawing inferences with books because as an author of, of some books, there's the in incentive to sort of write what sells 
and what sells is what's popular. So to paint this popular belief that hedge funds are evil short-term traders that don't care about the company's long-term value, that's something which is popular that conforms to people's beliefs about hedge funds, and so it will be successful. But I think in order to form policy, you want to say, what does the evidence say? And there's indeed some really nice studies on the effect of things such as short selling. And what they do is they look at shocks to short selling. For example, in the US, when they introduced a rule allowing short selling for some stocks, but not allowing short selling for other stocks. So you can have a nice treatment and nice control. And actually what they found was that short sellers stop things such as earnings manipulation and some of these unpurposeful actions. Why? Because the ability to trade against companies which are inflating their earnings was a good disciplining device. So I think we want to be um, swayed by the evidence rather than sort of popular books on these topics. Hey, team. So what I was what I was referring to, just to be clear, is, is specifically high frequency trading on based on algorithms. But, but you, in a way, have answered my next question, which was, um, you know, uh, referring to some some recently published research, and, and of course, it's it's not new on this topic of uh, of short termism and, and value or or potentially uh, well, the opposite destruction of value uh, in 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 a sense of the, the contribution by short uh, by short sellers and and um, other financial market participants. And I so you know in a way I understand from your comments earlier that you would. Second views of, of those like Luchin, who uh, Babchuk, who published, uh, for example, I think it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month at maximum, uh, research showing that uh, unlike views of some um, uh, major thinkers in this field, like Mar Mar uh, Martin Lipton, for example, uh, th th these specific mark participants have uh, a value also for, let's say, upholding uh, some standards of governance. Is that how I read you? Do I read you correctly on that? Yeah, that's correct. And while like, I don't agree with everything that Lucian says, because you first encountered me when I debated against him, what I do respect is that he always will base his positions on evidence. And so his view on, on, on short, on supposedly short term investors is not his hunch. It is based on large scale research, whereas Marty Lipton is, is indeed very influential, but he's not, he's a brilliant lawyer, but his expertise is not large scale academic evidence. And if indeed one wants to make a point as to do hedge funds in general at value, that is a large-scale academic evidential point. Yes. No, I think on, the, on this, we, we definitely agree. One, one last question I would like to ask before we unfortunately have to um, wrap up for um, today's conversation, and this is indeed a, a point that I've discussed with a couple of invitees on this program, is, is a point of director's duties, which is sort of where we departed from. Uh, and as you know, there's been... A, 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 enormous amount of studies and, and active conversation about whether directors' duties married to be redefined or rethought in this new environment of stakeholderism. Uh, as in Europe, the, the European Commission had uh, commissioned a report um, from the ENY uh, that basically tries to um, give it suggestions about whether director duties need further definition, uh, whether directors are actually acting and the, whether their responsibilities are aligned with the long-term um, nature of the corporation. So my last question to you, I guess, is whether you think that in legal terms, um, there needs to be further thought uh, or further changes to the laws of, of European and perhaps other countries that need to be made for, for directors' duties to make sense um, in, that, in this new, uh, let's say, more pluralistic uh, governance context, or are they um, sufficient as they, as, they, as they are defined today? I don't think a significant change needs to be made. And again, I'm going to try to base this on, on evidence rather than hunch. Now, I know that there's a lot of popular argument that we need to completely change directors' duties in order to repurpose companies. And unfortunately, people do have the incentive to be to support that position because you're seen as a radical, you're seen as a reformer of capitalism, and often those views are not based on the evidence. So let's think about the, the EY report, which I've published a, a full response to that, looking at the evidence behind that report. That affects that that attacks short-term shareholder value. But let's think about that concept. It's a contradiction in terms, right? We learn in Finance 101 that shareholder value is the present value of all future cash flows of a company. It's not just current profits. And that's not just in a textbook. In the real world, some of the valuable companies today, such as Tesla, have values which are much greater than their short-term profits. So the idea of maximizing shareholder value, that does automatically sort of get you to focus on the long term. And indeed, that's actually the evidence. 
what happens when um, companies put in proposals to pay their CEOs according to long-term shareholder value. Some very nice work by Caroline Flammer and Tima Bansal finds that not only do companies become more profitable, but they're also more innovative and they treat stakeholders better. So this is something which benefits not just shareholders, but, but, but wider society. Then let's go to the more legal aspect of the question. Um, the director's duties, like in the UK, where I have a bit more knowledge, it's to pr um, promote the, um, the success of the company for the benefit of the members as a whole. And so that's the, the duties are to the company. Now, members are certainly often interpreted as shareholders, but it also says there's also a duty to have regard to various stakeholders. Given that law is not my expertise, what I've done is I've asked to, to some very senior lawyers are there actually um, barriers within company law in the UK, which is perhaps seen as even more shareholder friendly than in the EU, which stop companies thinking about long-term purpose, and I'm told that they're not, right? So you can absolutely pursue purpose within director's duties of maximizing the success of the company. Even if we think about the benefit of shareholders, that benefit need not be narrowly defined as financial benefit. Many companies, their shareholders are ultimate pension funds. And what do pension funds care about is not just um, the income their pensioners are getting in retirement, but the standard of living, which will depend on things such as the climate. So if indeed the planet was two degrees warmer, then that would not be for the benefit of the shareholders of a company. So that benefit can also take in other, um, other non-financial objectives. So I think to sum up the response, I think actually, and controversially, sometimes the problem is we want more shareholder capitalism rather than less shareholder capitalism. Is that if we correctly define shareholder capitalism as being focused on the long term, and we recognize the evidence shows that when shareholders come in and engage with the company, typically things are good for no, not only shareholders, but also stakeholders. That's what we want. We don't want the alternative, which is managerial capitalism, where managers can be just complacent and not maximizing value. And that is one area on, on both um, Lucian Bebchuk and I would agree on. Yes, I was going to, uh, to, to say that it was one point that, uh, that or which you, you agreed in, in, your, in your debate. But... For the purpose of our conversation today, this has been a, um, a really fascinating uh, uh, discussion with you. And I think there are many other questions that I, I would like to explore, but uh, perhaps we don't have time today. But I, I would li like to really thank you, Alex, for, for your time and also for, for giving very pragmatic examples, which is something rare, you know, in, in discussions with academics, they sometimes stray into the world of theory. Uh, so I think that that's really valuable for our audience and we'll continue, um, obviously, uh, delving into these kind of uh, in these issues in, in in further episodes. For those of you who are interested uh, to learn more, uh, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel, but also to um, to review Alex's own uh, website, which has a, a wealth of material, and of course his book um, Grow the Pie. Um, and um, we'll be um, we'll be continuing this conversation in future episodes of Governance Dialogues. Thank you, Alex, for joining us from London. Really enjoyed that, Alyssa. Thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs>